All right. Hello, everybody. I am pulling up my chat. I'll try to look as we go. Uh, quick reminder, set your chat settings to everyone. Otherwise, <clears throat> no one will see them. Uh, we will give two minutes to this to lightly banter. Joe, you seem more committed to the scruff today than usual. Are you are you going to go from doing the George Michael very studied scruff to a, an actual beard? Are you going to head to Brandon Marsh territory? What's going on? Um, it's been a busy week, so I just haven't shaved. And I'm, okay. I'm Italian, so I grow like a full beard in like three days time. So fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, AB, my friend, how are you? I am better than Joe because he has been grinding on this mind-melting, useless, surreal crap all week. And um, I think he's looking pretty great, beard or no beard, for what he's gone through. That's true. Uh, all right, that's enough banter. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to Thursday Night Bulwark. I'm JVL here with my my very, very colleagues I'm very fond of, uh, Joe Perticone and A.B. Stoddard, both of The Bulwark. Two things before we get started. Uh, the first is that, yes, I am aware, as many of you have both commented and emailed me about, that Joe Biden is giving a speech right now as we sit here. Uh, people have asked, you know, why don't you push back so we could accommodate it? Or, you know, could we stream it during the show so we can talk about it? I don't know if you people realize, but 12 hours from now, I have to do another one of these shows and I'm going to need something new to talk about. So we're going to we're going to take the Biden speech from tonight. We're going to pretend it's not happening. And then when I sit down with Sarah Longwell tomorrow morning and, and again, 12 hours, Sarah and I will talk about the Biden speech as if because it'll be new content. Then that's that's why I'm not doing it. Um, secondly. We are doing another Bulwark Live event in Washington, D.C. on November 16th. I think I'm allowed to say this to you. I hope, I hope I'm allowed to say this to you. If not, Catherine will get mad at me. Uh, it'll be 7 p.m. in D.C. It, uh, well, it'll be everybody. I mean, not everybody, everybody. Like, we're not going to bring Sonny in from, from Dallas. But uh, most of us will be there. It'll be a lot of fun. And you should you should come if you're in dc okay uh all that said i will begin by dropping this in i was just sent a new quinnipiac favorability poll matching up joe biden and donald trump net net biden is at minus 20 favorability donald trump at minus 24 that seems reasonable both of these guys are basically the same person with uh you know both both have their flaws one Attempted a coup and is under 91 counts of felony indictment. The other is old. Well, three years old in the first guy. So, of course, that makes sense. Um, AB, do you want to say anything about that before we go? Just to, I want to bring the mood down before we start. <laughs> a perfect place to go, JVL. Yeah. Um, I, as you know, find it so hard to look at these polls. Um, they, uh, there's new ones out Bloomberg and morning consult showing Trump up in five of seven battlegrounds. I cannot believe it tied in Michigan, which is like, really, I thought the one blue hope, um, for Democrats lock and load. They, they got the threesome. It is genuinely, literally the craziest Republican party in the country the Michigan State Republican Party. And I just thought, anyway, it's, um, I'm rambling because it's really hard for me to take. But as you know, as we talk about so frequently, JBL, the one man is old and the other guy gave you cheaper eggs and gas. So that's going to be where people make up their minds or something. Or something. People are the worst. Uh, all right. So we're going to talk speaker stuff today. Joe, you wrote a newsletter, an outstanding edition of your Press Pass newsletter today, and it only took you 15 drafts of it because everything kept changing. We were joking in, in our Slack earlier in the week that Joe has been writing these things almost as if they're choose your own adventures with the, you know, to just try to figure out by the time we go to send it out what 
reality is is where <clears throat> can you give us just a brief where are we now what is the lay of the land as we sit here at 805 on thursday october 19 so uh we're basically the same place we were two weeks ago just like a lot of like groundhog day repetition has occurred um this morning, for instance, we thought that there was finally momentum to move a resolution that would empower Patrick McHenry. So he's technically the acting, I was speaking with a staffer for rules and they were basically telling me that it's, you know, there's a difference between acting speaker pro tempore and actual speaker pro tempore. McHenry is acting and so in his acting capacity, his only job is to steer the direction of getting a new speaker. To be the full speaker pro tempore, that means he's the speaker for a fixed amount of time and he can put bills on the floor and he can do all these things. That plan, which was floated by uh, Dave Joyce from Ohio, got torn to shreds in their three hour conference meeting today because I'm sorry, I have a question. Didn't Jordan at like 1145 this morning basically endorse this plan? Yeah. And so here's the issue is like Jordan said, um, here, I'll empower McHenry and I'll stay the speaker designee made up position and I'll, <laughs> and I'll stay there until January. And then in January, you'll come around and you'll elect me and I'll keep campaigning. And a lot of the members, even like super far right members, like Debbie Lesko, who's retiring now, so she's allowed to like say things now. She said, this is not fair. This is disingenuous of you to continue campaigning while you're pushing this. Um, and everyone was saying, you should drop out. We don't want you. Like a few months time isn't going to make a difference. And all of your supporters, like all of Jim Jordan's supporters, the way they pushed out Scalise, they pushed out this idea of empowering McHenry and we're like, no, we're sticking with Jordan. And so it's the same old tactics. And then by the time the meeting was wrapped around like one-ish, they came out and were like, no, it's dead, it's done. And then McHenry said- so These were Jordan's own people who killed the idea of- yeah. The same way- After Jordan, Jordan said that he was going to do it. Okay. Well, when he says it, like it doesn't carry much weight because they know he doesn't want it. Okay. So I for instance, when Scalise became the conference nominee, Jordan said, well, I support Steve Scalise. But only for one yeah. round, right? Yeah, I like get, get behind Steve Scalise. Privately, he was saying for only one round. And his supporters took that as no rounds. And that's how they forced him out. And so it's the same thing. And so now we're back to square one where they're like, we're going to vote again. And it's like, Jordan knows that that 22 that he lost on the second round is going to turn into 30, maybe even 40 on the, the next round. And so I don't know why they're going to keep going, but their tactics this whole time have been bullying and intimidation. And that's a lot of members are upset about that because all these people who have voted against Jim Jordan are getting violent threats. Um, Drew Ferguson is one of the anti-Jordan voters, and he now has a sheriff stationed outside of his daughter's school because you know, Steve Bannon and Glenn Beck and a lot of these conservative media figures say, look at this monster opposing the MAGA superstar Jim Jordan. And so a handful of these people then go and make violent threats. And I, I think this is the first time I've really seen members address this to one another. They're obviously not addressing the big picture that this is now our culture in the party. Um, but there was a lot of questions about it in their conference meeting this morning. So as of tonight, what's the plan for like tomorrow? Is uh, anybody going to bed tonight in the Republican conference know what the plan is for tomorrow? So I just got an email from uh, the press gallery saying that my ticket uh, for the proceedings of their vote is going to be valid tomorrow because you have to sign up each day. Um, and they were like, because there ended up not being a vote today, we're going to use today's tickets tomorrow if there's a vote tomorrow. And that's a big if. Members of Congress don't like to work on the weekend. They don't even like to work on Fridays. Um, so it, it'll just depend. They could do it. Just adjourn tomorrow. until Monday and then yeah. make it up on Monday. Yeah, I guess. 
Well, like, which means we'll enter a fourth week where we, after Tuesday, we're now in the third week. Um, and it'll be three weeks on Tuesday. So yeah, I have all my tickets. They initially were color coded, um, but then they ran out of colors and just started using stamps because this has gone on that long. So AB, I want to, for, for people who don't pay as close attention to you and Joe, I, I would like you to underscore for me that this is totally unprecedented, correct? Like this is, we just haven't been, maybe this happened during the civil war or during reconstruction. I don't know, but in the living memory, nobody alive has seen a caucus this dysfunctional and Nancy Pelosi's majority in, in, you know, 2020 going into 2022 was what? Five votes? The same. Yeah. Right. Same, same. And the Democratic caucus functioned fine. Right. I mean, they, they passed a bunch of stuff. They, they, they passed a bunch of bipartisan bills. It's not like the problem is the majority. The, the problem isn't the margin. It's not that it's five votes. The problem is the, the constituents who make up the caucus. Yes. Yeah, so Nancy Pelosi, much like Mitch McConnell, um, is very able uh, to keep the pulse, the constantly changing pulse with uh, events as they arise and, and, and fall and um, polling the changes and constant threats to people's political um, livelihood. And, and she has always been able, when she was in charge, of keeping everyone unified. So that is a constant ongoing process where you are handing out goodies, you're issuing threats, balancing needs and priorities, and really preaching the importance of unity. And um, what's, so it's, it's not the margin because it was exactly a mirror of her margin. It is, as you point out, the makeup of the conference. And the, as you have also pointed out, because I, I really like to, I don't want to repeat anyone's points and you and I have agreed on this over the years. It's like they made clear a while ago that the MAGA priority is not holding power. It is not to amass power and then keep power and do what it takes to make their populism popular with swing voters so that they can have majorities where they can actually pass policies their interest, as you noted this week, is, is to sort of cleanse the Republican Party and, and control it. So everyone is walking around in fear. McHenry doesn't want this job because he's terrified that he'll be in the crosshairs in nine days, and he would be. Um, McCarthy, I guess, is walking around sort of hoping that maybe he makes a comeback, but, but no one, uh, Jordan is in some delusional state where he feels like he has to keep running, but he knows that he's not going to win. And I was told by a chief there'll be a vote at 10 o'clock tomorrow. Um, maybe that will change. But, but this, the one thing that binds the right of the caucus is we will never make a coalition governing bloc with Democrats. That would be a sellout. Uh, and um, let's Interesting use fear. That that's the red line. The red line isn't, we'll never put a guy who trelped plan an insurrection right. into the role. Red the, line is don't work with Democrats. Red Democrat. line is we will not work with Democrats. Right. We will not govern. And we're fine with shutdowns. And we have shown in the last two weeks that we are contemptuous in the face of a new war in the Middle East, let alone what's going on with Ukraine and the government funding set to run out. We, are, we have shown in the last two weeks that we are contemptuous of our governing responsibility. Yeah, yeah, you guys keep saying that it's really important that we have a functioning house, but we have... We have to get in a room and brawl over conference politics. Like just, okay, just give us some time. At this point, it could be like a month or worse. And so it is the makeup of the conference. It's the makeup of the Republican party and it's completely out of control and bananas. And I would really like caution everyone. I like everyone here, so grateful to the people that stepped up and stopped Jim Jordan from becoming speaker. I, I woke up with a real dark pit at the beginning of this week, thinking it was on track to happen. And it was just one of, it was going to be one of those events for which we could not return. Um, and, and I uh, it was going to alter the Congress and the Republican party forever. And it's great that these people have stood up and it's great that the margin for him will only get worse tomorrow. 
but that doesn't mean that we have a bunch of people that are going to like not support Donald Trump next year and say, I don't need to be in a party where I have to send a sheriff to my daughter's school. This is outrageous. I'm done with you guys in this crazy cult. I'm out of here. I'm not going to be threatened by Steve Bannon anymore. This is like a temporary thing where they're going to ride it out. Some sucker is going to take this job. They're going to beat up on him all day. They're all going to support Donald Trump next year. Unless, you know, a bunch of them, like more of them retire. But I just don't see this as like a sea change. I think it's, I think Jim Jordan will be rejected. But I don't think this is like a moment where things are going to change in the party. I have so many questions. Um, First, for both of you, is Jordan really dead on arrival here? Like, do we really think that his candidacy is dead, dead? Or do we think that if he commits to going the full Kevin and he's willing to do 20 different votes, that eventually moderates just go moderates? Everybody else finally just says, fuck it. We got to get we got to get out of this. Whatever. Fine. Fuck it. Be the speaker for, you know, 10 months. I'm not convinced. I think that he there's really not anything he can do. We saw he tried to give away a doubling of the state and local tax deductions to the New Yorkers, and they were like, no. And now he's pissed off a lot of conservative groups because he's carved out a piece of the Trump tax cuts. And, you know, that was a huge blunder for him. And so when he did try to bargain away this thing that, you know, the Tea Party folks wouldn't want, it backfired badly and they didn't get anybody on board. The main block of people, if you read today's newsletter, are these appropriators. Like yeah. they don't like Jim Jordan because for 16 years, Jim Jordan has been the worst person to them. He has obstructed everything they've tried to do. His plan too, as a speaker would be to the stop the stopgap funding bill that goes till April. And so it's like all this stuff, like he's basically saying your job is irrelevant. Like that's why the chairwoman of the appropriations committee is not supporting him. And that's why tons of others are just not on board. And it was, that's why it was so shocking too, that Tom Cole, you know, had to deliver that like, you know, self-flagellating speech where he was like, everybody please vote for Jim because this is a guy who doesn't like Jim Jordan because of how Jim Jordan's acted for almost two decades and that speech too like it wasn't even like good he was like yeah jim's the only guy who wants to cut social security and like i'm glad (laughs) i'm I'm glad the c-span cameras didn't pick me up like laughing when that happened because it was just it was genuinely like awful watching someone have to do that and gosh i i just don't think that there's really much of anything that Jordan can do or give away. Like McCarthy had a lot to bargain away in January. Jim Jordan doesn't have those options. He can't dole out committee assignments because those are already set. So there's just a really limited amount of space for him here. And there's, you know, years of distrust. AB, you concur? I I mean, I completely agree with Joe because the people, if you stood up to Jim Jordan on Tuesday, And then on Wednesday, you're not going to fold now. And they, they're, you know, remember, we thought it was going to be five or six. It turned out to be 20 and grew. And these people are mad. So they never trust him to begin with. But now they're just, they're refusing to even take his phone calls because they've told him, like, they literally said, you're done. Like you've, we are so mad. If you didn't personally do it, if if your right-wing media colleagues didn't personally threatened me, you threatened my colleague and my friend, and we're so mad about these tactics. And as Joe points out, there's no goodies he can hand out to that. A, they don't believe it when he says to, to McCall, like, oh yeah, I could see pairing Israel aid with Ukraine. I could see that. Like, that is not a promise that he can take to the bank. So he's foolish to think that that was, you know, a reason to support Jordan, but he did. So no, the, everyone I talk to says he's dead. And it's, it's not, he can't come back. People are more furious with each passing hour on, on the, again, on the like non hardliner side. And 
I don't want to call anyone conservative in that conference, and I don't want to call anyone moderate. So it's really hard to find new terms for these people. So here's a, I mean, let me just fast forward on this. It seems like this, I mean, we are in this confrontation because Matt Yates really had a personal vendetta against Kevin McCarthy, right? This is, and what began as like, you know, the, the Archduke Ferdinand getting shot in Sarajevo, all of a sudden, like now we're in the middle of a world war, right? Like what, what starts as like this stupid petty thing. And now I, can these guys, let's pretend there is a speaker. How can they work together? Because it seems like a bunch of them actively hate each other and are trying to like kill each other's careers and and also don't trust one another, right? You can dislike somebody, but basically trust them to keep their word on something. I don't know how, like, how does Humpty Dumpty go back together again? I mean, I guess it's the house and you get lots of turnover and in six years, the Republican conference will look very different from what it looks like today because people leave and people come. But I don't know. Like, I, I, I just have never, even during the Gingrich days, people didn't hate each other as in the conference as much as they do now. Did they, A.B.? Joe doesn't read no. Newt Gingrich. Joe only I mean, read about him in history books. Right, but. right. Joe, there once was a man. Um, no, it is true that uh, there were more things that connected you in the past. You worked on things called bills together in committee. <laughs> And you cooperated. And so you had more buildup of connection and bonds and um, reservoirs of kind of trust and good faith that you would lean into when things got a little hot. And now you have those appropriators you talk about who are members of the uni party, according to Steve Bannon. And those are the people you, when you go rhino hunting, you go after those big fat spenders who just are looking for a big fat lobbying paycheck when they leave. Cause they were, you know, they were cardinals, they were appropriators and they're going to be able to make the most when they leave. And so they're basically as good as Democrats and anyone who wants to preserve the institution is as good as a Democrat. So Everyone is a sellout, um, depending on the establishment, the way Matt Gates described it on the floor, literally two weeks ago, like, you guys, that's fine. You, you just keep running to your lobbyists and I'm going to be fine out there because he has, he's fueled by small dollar donations. So the process has changed. The system has changed. The incentives has changed. No one does anything anymore together. And so there's no way for them to really be concerned and look out for each other as a unit. Then you layer over the fact that the party is just changing so fast in terms of what we thought was the MAGA wing. Let's go back to like spring of 21. You know, it's post January 6th. Only some crazies are talking up. Sure, the Senate didn't take care of him and they didn't convict him, but he's somewhere in Mar-a-Lago isolated and surely this will all calm down and there's going to be like some post no, no, no. They are ascendant. They're dominant. And now, you know, people who are like whatever institutionalists are um, are under death threat and not even for voting to impeach, like voting to like not shut the government down or against Jim Jordan. So it's very, very different than it's ever been. It is very, very hard for me. They won't have much legislating to do. Um past this fall. That's what's so interesting. If you had this mini speaker and they were permitted to work with Democrats to just quickly get Ukraine and Israeli aid and the government funding bill, like a year long CR or whatever out the door, don't worry, there will be no legislating in 2024. So they could all go back to like their nihilist fights and like a fake speaker who gets beaten and behind closed doors every week because they're not gonna pass anything anyway. But yeah, there's, there's so much contempt um, and the tactics of fear of using, you know, the lifeblood of MAGA is this intimidation and this brute force fear. And, and it, it is going to cleanse the same people are going to have to leave. They're going to be, they're not going to be able to take it anymore. When you say JVL, what will look so different in six years. I mean, I shudder to think 
about the House Republican conference six years from now. Joe, what is the what is the mood within the Republican conference? Like, you know, like is it sort of, you know, are, is there like gallows humor? Is there a sense that they're caught up in farce? Do they like do they really hate each other? Are we looking at like the way it used to be on the floor during like right up to the run up to this to the Civil War when you know guys would get into fist fights on the floor? I mean, what there was almost a fist fight this morning, apparently. Um, in their closed door conference meeting, um, Matt Gates started to speak and McCarthy told him to sit the fuck down and he got down and then people started screaming at each other and you know, we saw a little bit of that on the floor in January and it's like each time it gets like close and people get held back and it's like, don't we kind of want it? One of happen? these days, I think it would Can be- Can I say that? Is it wrong to say that? But I think I'd like be to see these terrible. guys get into a slap fight because right. the idea of, you know, Matt Yates and Kevin McCarthy, big manly <laughs> men that they are going at it, like it would be like watching two five-year-olds try to wrestle, no? <laughs> I th- I think that like, I was I was watching on the floor during um, yesterday's vote or the day before I don't remember, but Mark Wayne Mullen, former House guy, former MMA fighter before he was in Congress, now is in the Senate and he came back to the House floor and he was like yucking it up with um, all of his old colleagues. A few weeks ago, when this happened, he publicly said that Matt Gates used to crush ED medicine and chug Red Bull, and. Gates was livid about that. And I saw him like slowly getting closer to Gates on the floor. And like, everyone was like watching like the real negotiating groups. And I was just like, I was like staring at Mark Wayne Mullen. I was like, please, please confront Gates. Um, but he, he ultimately didn't and ducked out. So like, there's, there's a chance that things can boil over. All of them seem to center back on Matt Gates because Matt Gates is the most antagonistic person in the conference. He's the one that started this. Um, something that Don Bacon- he's a classic wrestling heel, right? I mean, he's like yeah. the honky tonk man or Bobby the Brain Heenan or, yeah. right? I mean, he's a guy who's there because he gets off on making people hate him. Yeah. Oh, exactly. And like something that Don Bacon pointed out, it's like kind of the crux of this big fight amongst people like Don Bacon is that he said, Matt Gates and- all of the Jordan supporters, he said, they're the ones who caused this. They're the ones who broke the conference rules by doing this on their own. And now they're telling us that their candidate gets to be the speaker. That's not how it works. And so that's one faction of people. Jordan has to deal with way more different factions than McCarthy did. McCarthy just had the Freedom Caucus. Jordan has the appropriators. He's got these like moderate New Yorkers, like Garbarino and Mike Lawler, Mike Lawler. And then he's got these angry institutionalists like Don Bacon. And then he's got like the Scalise loyalists. And so he's dealing with all these warring factions, none of whom like him at all. And that's why the number keeps growing. And he is not a guy with any emotional intelligence, correct? I mean, this is as dumb as Kevin McCarthy was, the the selling point for him was. His emotional IQ is very good. Is he's really great at glad handing, and you know he he knows how to tell people what they want to hear and make them feel when like you, he likes them. So that when is you not watch, in Jordan's toolbox, yeah, yes. When you watch committee hearings, and I've noticed this, especially since they got the gavels back, is for example James Comer, like during the oversight hearings, when he's they go back and forth between Democrats and Republicans, every other speaker. And he's very cordial about granting people their time and quickly moving on to the next person. Jordan doesn't do that. Jordan chimes in. He grants himself. He'll go, I recognize myself for a minute. And he'll do these little mini monologues in between every Democrat's questioning round to invalidate everything they just said. And MAGA people see that as, oh, he fights. But his colleagues see it as he's an absolute jerk who doesn't respect us. And so you can see that telegraphed in every level of how he's ran this. The way he said, apparently, to um, Scalise, America wants me. 
I'm America's speaker. <laughs> and it's like, dude, not even most of your like colleagues want you. Nobody wants you except for like the worst people. And so there's just really, he has not done these things that McCarthy and past speakers have done to curry this favor. And Patrick McHenry, for example, is well liked across the board, but he doesn't want the job. He's even to the point where he said he'd resign as acting speaker if they try to move legislation to the floor in this in his current capacity. So I have a question. It's more for AB than for Joe. Uh, back during the attempt to steal Georgia, there was a moment when I forget his name, the guy who is lieutenant governor of, of Georgia. He was you know, somebody's writing a profile of him. And he Jeff was, Duncan, Jeff Duncan. Yeah. And he was sitting in his office and could hear all the MAGA people like, you know, screaming and yelling outside. And he said to the reporter, I forget the reporter was he's like, geez, those are my voters. They want to kill me. So we live in a world of negative polarity, right? The way most of politics works is negative polarity. People see there's a group of people who I don't like. They think X. So I think Y. Right. This is this is tri tribalism, negative polarity. Why is it that if you are a House member who has to get a sheriff to guard your daughter against death threats, negative polarity does not kick in. And you don't say, huh, the side making death threats against my kid. That's not my side. I'm against them. Why? Why would these? I don't understand why a bunch of these people aren't just switching parties. Well, I think, the, yeah, I've heard you raise this and I think it is a, it's an option. I think that. No, it's not. I mean, this, to be clear, it's fantasy politics. All like they're not going yeah. to, I just don't so understand why not do, because right? again, it's negative polarity. Like it's, that's what people used to do when you would not ha face death threats for it. You could do it and your old colleagues would make fun of you in the lunchroom, but that was, that was it. Now, that's, I mean, I think that obviously they would rather retire and we're going to see a bunch of retirements. I mean, De Debbie Lesko will not be the last one. Um, and I think that that's going to be the out is just to leave is that you just can't keep taking it. Um, and then the more crazy people will come in um, to conservative or conservative seats to red seats. And then Democrats will come back to, um, some of those New York seats, um, whether the guy runs or the guy retires, there's a good number of them. Um, I think that will be won back by the Democrats. But yeah, it's it's it is just so interesting because what we've been craving for years is for someone to stand up and say this is lunacy. Uh, I can't take it anymore. And I guess Jeff Duncan and some people have said stuff like that out in the country before they walk off into the sunset, but not really enough in, in the Congress or the Senate. And um, perhaps their future paychecks depend on their continued connection to the body and those relationships. Yeah, but, um, but yeah, I'm waiting for a jailbreak, um, even though in the end, it's gonna bring more crazy people here. Maybe it brings more Democrats, but I want like a loud outspoken jailbreak as a result of this your lips to God's ears. So Joe, sketch out for me, like if you were going to make a decision tree, here, will you sketch out for me like the, I don't know, like the three most likely scenarios for the coming week? I tried to do this earlier in the week where I, you know, I, I was like, here are the five scenarios in descending order of likelihood. Uh, what, what do you see as the, like, what, what are the options? Because right now, the way you guys have talked about it, I think to myself, geez, it sounds like there aren't any options. Yeah, I would say a very likely possibility is that nothing has changed. We're still kind of doing this. Jordan's having meetings. Wow. Like a week whole, from now? Yeah, it's possible. Another possibility is that Jordan is still trying to run, but a new candidate emerges. This could be a Mike Johnson or a Kevin Hearn, someone who's, you know, obviously super far right, but isn't, doesn't have the baggage 
but I don't think he brings the Jordan supporters aboard. So we're still technically in the same place. Um, maybe there's momentum again to empower McHenry. Problem with that is that there's so many Republicans opposed. It would require Democrats to support it. Democrats have requirements too. Some of those involve honoring the commitments made in the debt deal in May. Um, one of them, which is an important one, is that whoever <clears throat> an acting speaker pro tempore becomes that we choose and grant these extra powers cannot be someone who tried to decertify the election. McHenry falls into this because he voted to certify. Um, but for example, Kevin Hearn, uh, Tom Cole, even these, they all voted to reject the election results in some capacity. And so there's, Sorry, there's I don't, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I, I just want to ask this while we're thinking of it. Could McHenry accept the job if he's put there with democratic votes or are, are the presence of democratic votes, a poison pill for him where he says, Nope, sorry, I can't do that. Because yeah. that then becomes hazardous to his health. It, I think we've seen very clearly let, that the coalition option is not going to happen. Um, even when I was with Mario diaz Balart, one of the Never Jordan guys, he made a point. He was like, I will never, ever, ever vote for a Democrat in any capacity. Like that, he was like, that's the worst sin a person can commit. And so... The idea of a coalition forming, there's very limited options. And it's like McHenry, who doesn't want it. And most of the Republican conference is still holding out for some dream of maybe Jim Jordan or somebody else or bringing McCarthy back. There's really limited options. McCarthy coming back, that's also an option, but then he's still stuck in the same place. Are there Can they just reset? I mean, this is this is great. This is actually the plot of a top one. One of Tom Clancy's lesser Jack Ryan books uh, is that there's like a giant attack on the stock exchange and it blows up and the U.S. financial system craters. And what they eventually decide to do is we're just going to go back to what the world looked like the day before the stock exchange got blown up. We're going to just assign every company the same value it had then. And could they just say, you know what, this whole thing turned out to be a clusterfuck and a big mistake. Uh, we're going to go back to exactly what it was and... Matt Gates will have made his point and, you know, we'll just reinsert McCarthy. Is that possible? Right. So something I thought today is that this is the kind of behavior that in other countries would trigger a snap election. And between January 6th and this, like, it's obvious that the Republican Party is increasingly acting like a third world political party. They can't do anything right. They're not willing to do anything. They are increasingly hostile to each other and to their colleagues. And it's just like, it's really nuts. And so the yeah, getting into the business of trying to predict what happens next has been really difficult. Like I thought we were headed for a government shutdown and Kevin McCarthy did the right thing. And that's what blew this all up is averting a government shutdown. So on top of this, we could have a government shutdown in a few weeks time. Funding expires November seventeenth. A B, could we still be here with no Republican, with no Speaker of the House, and a government shutdown? Is that a way that, to put it this way, could the Republicans who want a shutdown get us there by simply making sure we don't have a Speaker, so that it is not possible for the House to pass a CR? Oh yeah, I, I mean, like absolutely. It's a way of getting a shutdown without McHenry is having a, to vote a human on the CR. Like Mc, empowering McHenry makes him like a human CR. That's why it's been so difficult. Right. This is right. <laughs> so if they don't empower him, right? Yeah. This is if you are a Republican who wants a shutdown, but you don't want to have to vote for a shutdown. One of the things you could do is simply make this thing keep going for another twenty-one days or whatever it is. And that thing oh, yeah, gets no shut down without having to, to defeat legislation. Right. There's no question. Um, the, the, it's going to be interesting uh, over the next couple of days because the no votes have already, the um, holdouts have already told Jordan, like you're there's, you're done. Like you're not coming back. And then one of his allies is on Twitter and I'm sorry, his name is escaping me right now saying that, um, 
they're potentially going to have weekend votes. So they are like, they're kind of threatening to try to like grind everyone down. And I don't think you can grind these people down, but the, the McHenry thing is over with. He is terrified. He was an architect of the May debt deal between President Biden and Kevin McCarthy. He voted to certify Joe Biden's election. He is the definition of an accommodating uni party squish. And he doesn't, he, after today, he knows that he cannot handle this job. I mean, that's, it's just a no win situation for him. And no, he would never take it with a bunch of Democrats and a few, and like a couple of Don Bacon's. Like that's not going to be where, that's not where Patrick McHenry wants to find himself. And Heritage Action is whipping against a governing block. And he expanded powers of McHenry. So um, that that is just for now, that's just over with. I mean, I would love it to be revived in <laughs> exasperation weeks from now. But for now, that's not like a choice on the table for the House Republican Conference. What does Trump want in all of this? I mean, I, I know that he is endorsed, right? He endorsed Jordan, but that doesn't mean he really wants Jordan to be speaker, right? What what serves Trump's interest here? He wants, well, he wants the impeachment to pick back up. He wants Joe Biden to be impeached for beating him in an election. That's all he wants from Congress. Okay, so he wants he wants a speaker then. Yeah, I don't think he's thinking that in depth about it, but like what he wants from Congress is for them to impeach Joe Biden for beating him in the election. And he probably wants a government shutdown too. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Because that's bad for Biden. Yeah. Yeah. That like he wants Congress to use its tools to damage Biden. So, uh, I don't know. I mean, have Ramesh Panuru, my, my buddy from National Review, wrote a I bet for the Washington Post the other day, it was like, you know, maybe we don't really need a speaker. And he, he, what he was floating was basically a version of uh, making McHenry a, or somebody else, uh, the, the official temporary, temporary, is that pro temporary? Is that right? Um, I mean, but how do you even get to that? Right. And I, maybe there's a way, as you just guys said, it's hard to do it. It can't be McHenry. Who who could it be? Who could qualify? Uh, I mean, I don't know. Like, how long could this go for? Getting a a speaker pro tempore to get these like expanded powers cannot be accomplished without Democratic votes. Um, we learned that this morning. That's why they threw it in the garbage bin in their meeting because. There are too many Republicans who won't get on board. And so it has to have Democratic votes. And in order for it to have Democratic votes, you have to violate the majority of the majority rule. So you're already doing something bad in Republicans' eyes. And Democrats have a set of demands to do this too. So there's there's like no, there's such a finite window. And the only person really that fits into that is Patrick McHenry, and he's not going to do it. He doesn't want it. So And he's shown that he's not going to be forced into it the way Paul Ryan was. So what does the end game look like? Like, You know, at some point we get to, we get to the end of this. AB, what does the end look like? So I'm with you. It's not the craziest thing to think that some people break down and we have McCarthy again. And, um, I just don't think that that's out of the question at all. And he was planning to be shadow speaker for Jordan and shadow speaker for McHenry anyway. So he, you know, he, CNN reporting today, he's not, t- he won't let them take the sign off the door. He's in that office, you know, he's, so I don't think that's out of the question. I think there's always a path back for that. That's, that's not crazy. I mean, look, fantasy, like chapter 97. Four guys say like, you know what? I'm actually not retiring. I'm resigning right now. So they don't vote for Hakeem Jeffries for speaker. They leave the house like before Thanksgiving and Hakeem Jeffries is speaker. And they're like, sorry, dudes. And open up a lobbying shop a couple of weeks later, like Chris Stewart from Utah. It's not out of the question. I mean, these people are exasperated. Their lives are at stake. Does it just take four? Is that all it takes? What, Right, Joe? Uh, I think for that, it would take five. 
Okay. Well, okay. So, so anyway, but just five. I mean, that's definitely that's a fantasy, five. definitely a fantasy, but I mean, that's not crazy just to just storm out and say, like, I, I can't take it another month. I can't. And um, that's just not crazy. I spoke to a Republican lobbyist the other day who said that he believes that Hakeem Jeffries will be speaker by the end of this cycle. And I don't think he meant that people will die. He literally said this will go on much longer than people think. All right. So final question. It's more of a Sarah question than a Joe or AB question, but I'll ask it anyway. (laughs) Do Republicans pay any electoral price for this? Or is all of this just process, right? Voters don't give a shit about process. Voters only care about the price of eggs unless it's the price of celery, unless it's the price of gas, unless it's God, God knows. Um, but is there is there a world in which this dysfunction and inability to govern hurts either House candidates in 2024 or the Republican presidential nominee? Because... People say this, this, this party can't be given power. President, no. I think, and there's deep irony here, is that the people who this is going to hurt are like the moderates trying to keep it together. Like Mike Lawler, he's toast. He's the one like, (laughs) he's the one like trying to keep it together. And like, he's going to pay the biggest price because he's in this purple district and they're like, his voters will go, no, no, this guy can't govern. He's one of them. (laughs) They won't make that distinction. So yes, I think some could pay because of this, especially if it bleeds into a shutdown. Um, But it it won't be Matt Gates. It won't be, it won't be those types. Won't be Jim Jordan. Won't be any of those guys. AB. I agree. I mean, the red guys are safe and that's what members and former <clears throat> members, you know, and chiefs were saying to me this week, like they will always be safe. Right. And so what you're doing is just shrinking the big tent. You're, you're purifying the party so that even if they're in the minority and we obviously know they don't care about the majority, I mean, the nihilist oh, caucus right. does not care about holding power. And so they're just purifying and cleansing the conference. But I do think Unless something, unless something crazy happens over the weekend, everyone rallies behind Mike Johnson or Jack Bergman or whatever, right? Um, that and they're all like, "Oh my God, this is great! Why didn't we think of it sooner? We're all so happy now, and it's awesome. We have a speaker, and it's all over with." And then they go on to pass like a CR till April, and it's a one percent sequester or whatever their you know their radical plans are. If they manage to ride out, to somehow repair this now, I don't think the voters will notice. But if this gets into a a government shutdown, which really hurts real people's lives, and even to people who don't consume the news, I mean, even they end up finding out about it. It has ripple effects throughout the economy. It's really bad. And so I think that that will be known, um, just like um, Ted Cruz's, you know, led shutdown it, it, it will it will ripple out to people who uh, who tend to tune this stuff out if we get um if we get if the government shuts down on november 17th and we're really the white house has been nervous about this for so long that we would get near a government shutdown without a speaker they're really 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 scared of that scenario because they're afraid of the you know the it, the not only just the damage to the country but and the real pro- substantive problem but it will boomerang on them as well. But I think that that is the end of the Republican majority. If, if people are hearing on the news that there has not been a speaker for a month and now they refuse to to pass. Joe Biden is so on the Cletus because Sarah's not here to yell at me that damn there. Joe Biden is so old. He can't even get them a God darn speaker. Right. Right. (laughs) It's always on shit. We still don't have a speaker because of that Brandon feller. It is always his fault. My God. Okay. Well, uh, great. This has been just a fabulous live stream. I mean, it's wonderful because I feel much smarter about all this stuff because of you guys. And I, I deeply appreciate it. Um, it's depressing because it, it hadn't really occurred to me before we sat down that this could just be, we think to ourselves, 
oh, this heck, this can't possibly go on. But in fact, like we could be in the very beginning stages of it. That's amazing. It can always get worse. It can always, get, you know, it's always darkest before it goes pitch black. Um, <laughs> all right, uh, guys, that cheery note. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for being with us. If you are in DC for the November 16 event, thebulwark.com slash events, come and hang out with us. I'm going to try to be there. No promises. Uh, but uh, AB and Joe will be there and Charlie will be there and Tim and Sarah and uh, Mona. All the, like everybody else will be there. Um, so have a good rest of the Thursday night. Go enjoy Texas Houston. That game is on right now. The Phillies lost right before we went on the air. That's okay. Uh, and we'll see you next week. Bye guys. <laughs>